Uh, feel free to pass them around and take a look. This is the thing I'm going to be talking about. Yeah, so uh, we have Davey today, who's going to be sharing about this in building a living room clock with PSP32 C6 ULB. Yep. You can tell me more. Um, I need some back books for please, otherwise, I'm going to have an issue. <laughs> right, we'll uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to screen. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, you already said who I am. These are my credentials, things, etc. Um, oh, one of the things to point out is I work for Expressive. This thing uses an Expressive product. Um, I am not paid aside from my salary. I just use them because I can get them for free. I mean, because they're awesome too. <laughs> um, so about time, uh, we have a little one running around and that means that suddenly uh, when we normally were like, oh, I need to leave in five, so five minutes, that's fine. It's now, oh, I need to leave in five minutes, that's fine. Don't stop there. <laughs> so keeping track of time is a little bit harder. Um, and we don't have, or, or, or we used to not have a clock in our living room. For me, that's not an issue because I'm a guy, I have pants with, uh, with big uh, uh, things. So I can just take out my phone and I can see stuff. Um, my wife is not so lucky, uh, so she is like every time she needs to look at the time, she needs to figure out where the hell she left her smartphone and then look at that. And she she got pretty, pretty uh, irritated by that. So she was like, yeah, can we just buy a, a clock for the living room? And I'm like, buy? Buy? <laughs> exactly. Clocks are great. You can do awesome things with clocks. You can make mechanical contraptions up to a zoo. You can go for ancient flip uh, uh things. You can go for like lighting that also tells you the time. But, uh, like, like you can even go entirely carry one for something that's completely, you know, why the hell would I buy a clock? So, okay. But, you know, I did have some needs. Like, uh, for instance, those, those dial indicator clock would be a little bit hard to read if you're, if you're you know, running after a, a two-year-old. So first of all, it needs to be daylight uh, readable. Our, our, our um, living room is usually used when it's, when it's daylight. If it's night, then you know, the little one is asleep and it's not that much of an issue anymore. Um, it needs to be battery driven because the location that we wanted, uh, uh, we wanted to have it does not have any power things nearby. And also I didn't really want to have any wires hanging around. Uh, it needs to have a long life. If the thing runs off batteries, I don't want to replace the batteries every, every week or something. Low maintenance, same thing there. It should just synchronize to the internet. Everything modern does that. Uh, this needs it to uh, this needs to do it as well. And it needs to be obviously cool. So, um, you know, one of the things that you immediately go at is e-ink displays. Um, because obviously e-ink displays are very low, low cost, they're super, super readable in daylight, etc. Um, but if you want to have one that you can read the time from from the other side of the living room, then <laughs> that's um you know, I do want a cool clock, but maybe not that badly. <laughs> so, but you know, this is a very interesting site. They have like a lot of types of walking ink displays, and they also have like cheaper ones that are just a little bit smaller. Um, so um, I was like, you know, these are 20. Like even if I buy four, then it's only 80 bucks. That is a lot less than the, the almost 400 bucks that I that I uh, have. Don't make the So, I can't even put them in the right order because they're two zeros. Um, so uh, I was like, you know, uh, maybe I should just go for the coolness factor and, and make and make four of them. And obviously, I can put all four of them on like one PCB. But you know, if you buy a PCB, uh, if you send off to to China or wherever for a PCB, you get five of them. So you might just as well make like a design per uh, e-ink uh, display. And then I use four of my five uh, things and I have like four modules. So great. Um, so for a tip, as I said, I work for Expressive. I can get those for cheap. So, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> let's go with that. But actually that's not the only reason I picked this particular chip. So this is an ESP32 C6. Um, there's lots of crap in there that is not really relevant uh, at the moment. Most important bit is you guys all know that USB chips have Wi-Fi things. So I can easily connect them to the internet and grab the time from the internet. Um, great. But this particular chip also has a, a new and improved older, older 
uh, SPECTRIC chips also had them in some form, uh, a low power, low power coprocessor. So this is a little little secondary processor that runs at 40 megahertz, I think, in this chip. It has 16K of, of RAM to go along uh, uh, with that. And the trick is that um, you know, uh, your ESP chip can go full blast connecting to Wi-Fi, et cetera, and it will suck like a few hundred milliamp down the down the battery battery if it does that. It can also effectively play that. It's called deep sleep and it uses like microamp or two, something like that. It's like next to nothing. Thing is, it also does next to nothing. Um, <laughs> so uh, for all the chips, if you want to want to do it, uh, want it to do something, then you have some sort of wake up source, either you twiddle a GPIO or you set a timer or whatever. And as soon as that goes off, the, the main CPU goes full blast and wakes up and does things. But you know, uh, spinning up the main CPU is something that, that takes a while because ESP IDF needs to be overloaded off the flash and, and um, you know, CPU is just doing stuff at full speed. So that's not very efficient, even if you only do a little bit and then shut it down again. So the idea of the low power code processor is that it, that it can wake up instead and it only skips like a few milliamps and it can then do a thing and then go back to sleep. This is ideal because if I want to have a clock, I need to wake up to change like the time every minute. And I don't want that to shut down my battery. So if I can use the low power process uh, for that, you can do it pretty efficiently. Um, so uh, next up is our schematic. This is fairly simple. You've got your, your, your ESP32. Uh, can I use the mouse? Maybe easier for the Zoom people. Uh, you've got your ESP32 module here. I use a module because it can be asked to figure out how RF stuff works. Um, it's got a reset button here. It's got a boot button here in order to program it. Um, it's got this thing. This is a 32 kilohertz crystal. You don't usually see that, but the thing is in deep sleep, the main crystal is also turned off. And that means that the only thing that the ESP has to, uh, to uh, keep time, at the time is an internal oscillator, which is like plus minus 5% or 10% or something. It's like, it can be good enough, but not good enough for an actual clock where Keeping time is kind of sort of important. Um, it also has a thing where it measures the battery because if the battery runs dead, then I don't want to have a clock that, that is just sitting there. Or even worse, one digit that is just sitting there showing the wrong time. So I measure that, and if that's the case, then the entire thing uh, just shuts down with an error like battery into it. Um, aside from that, there's a USB-C connector. Uh, C6 has an internal USB serial JTAG converter, so I just connect to that and you can program the thing using that without any other external components. It's great. Okay, uh, e-ink display. This looks complicated. It's not. This is almost one-to-one -one what the data sheet says that you should do. So uh, an e-ink display needs slightly high voltages in order to do the e-ink magic. I think it's like plus 15 or and, and minus 15 volts or something. And the thing is that these uh, smaller e-ink displays have an internal uh, boost controller for that. But, um, you know, it's all on glass. They can't put the power electronics there. They can't put the inductor there. So you have to put that there externally. And that is what all this bit is about, like the, the um, uh, MOSFET and the inductor and the diodes, et cetera. Uh, the rest is all more or less uh, like a bunch of decoupling um, uh, capacitors and uh, an SPI port, and that's it. So finally, power supply. Uh, the uh, U2 here is your old standard lithium ion charger. Uh, takes power off the USB-C uh, port and uh, charges the battery. Um, I, I, I like to integrate the, these. I, like in theory, I shouldn't have to uh, charge the batteries that often. That is a problem, but it takes up nothing and I have a bunch of them in my drawer anyway. Uh, this little circuit here is a diode and a MOSFET because it's actually very bad practice to use power from a battery while it's charging. Uh, you can kill the battery pretty efficiently mm -hmm. with that because the charging chip will get very confused with regards to if the battery is full or not and will overcharge the battery. So this is a little uh, um, uh, trick I picked up somewhere from a microchip uh, application node. It works great. And that all goes into a 3.3 volt LDO. Um, this is a nice uh, low dropout uh, uh, one that has a low quiescent current, so it doesn't eat up much power itself either. And it can it can uh, output 500 milliamps, which uh, in normal circumstances is, is perfectly good for any normal ESP32. In normal circumstances, <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> So, uh, the PCB, KiCad, uh, I mean, I've got heaps of room. This was trivial, more or less. 
Um, 3D render, I love the 3D render function in KiCad because you can immediately see if you have two overlapping things or anything that looks weird. Uh, so real version, uh, yeah, sorry, you all saw it. Sorry to zoom people, it's like here. I, I would give it to you, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. On the back side, yeah. Okay. Uh, software. Um, so a little bit about clocks. Normally, if you have a clock that's a minute late or a minute early, who cares? You know, your 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 time doesn't run by the minutes, especially not if you if you have a clock that's on a wall. However, for this clock, it is like actually super 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 bad if there is a time difference of a minute because each of these modules acts like a separate clock. So if you have a module that's like half a minute out, what you get is you go from uh, you know half past uh, um, almost half past eight to oh this module is a little bit fast, and now you went back in time nine minutes. <laughs> and obviously, if the other module catches up, then the time is correct uh, again. But this needs to be a living room clock. It's big. I need to glance at it and and then know what time it is. So I can't even for a second have two modules running out of sync and showing me the wrong time. So in order to fix that every night at eight, um, there's actually uh, one one module that that uh, turns on its uh, main processor, turns on its Wi-Fi, connects to my access point, get, gets a DHCP lease, connects to the internet, connects to an NTP server, and gets the time. Mm -hmm. All of that takes about as long as I described it, sometimes longer, like it's a good 10, 10, 10 seconds if you're unlucky. And, and for all that time, the main processor is blasted. So, for this digit in particular, you can handle that because this digit in particular is the tens of hours. It only needs to refresh its contents three times a day. So it has battery battery life to, to spare. For the minutes, no way. I don't want to go through that. So rather than do that, I see one digit only. And then uh, when it's midnight, uh, what happens is that um, all uh, modules turn on their Wi-Fi, but they don't connect to an access point. They don't connect to the internet. What they do is they uh, start something called ESP Now, which is a little protocol that um, allows you to send packets directly from ESP to ESP. Um, and because it is peer-to-peer, -peer, it doesn't need to initialize a connection. It doesn't need to connect to an access point. It just blasts the packet out in the sky, and, and whoever listens to it you know, gets a chance to respond. The nice thing about this is that it's very, very, very fast. So. Um, uh, the, the, the main module, the uh, 10, 10 hours module, will start up and 10 seconds long, it will just broadcast, broadcast the exact time as it knows it. Now, the other modules will come, uh, come up around the same time, maybe a second early, maybe a second late. As soon as they get the time, they synchronize their clock and send an acknowledge uh, and then go back to sleep. And then as soon as the, the 10 hours uh, module saw three acknowledges from all three things, it goes back, back to sleep. Entire process, if you're unlucky, takes two seconds. You know, normally it's like one second or something. It's very, very power efficient, which is exactly what I want. Um, okay, so one more thing. This is a digit. Um, it's a bitmap. It's rendered from a true type font. Um, it's 240 times 416 pixels, exactly, because that's the re resolution of the, uh, the e-ink display. That's about, give or take, 100,000 pixels. And if you convert that into bits with like a black is uh, uh, a black is a zero and a white is a one, then you get about 12k per digit. That's all good and nice, but we only had 16k, so that is really, really not gonna fit. So, um, yeah, a bit of a complicated image. Sorry, I need to make something better. Uh, what I'm trying to say with here is that I solved the issue by doing RLE encoding. So I effectively go through the lines, count the amount of white pixels, and the first black pixel I see, I'm like, oh, I have this many white pixels. And for the black pixels, the same. Oh, I have this many black pixels. Then, 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 then for the white pixels, again, I do the same. So, so. Write them all down. I encode them in uh, a format because, you know, ideally I, I, I want to use one byte per, per, per run. Um, but sometimes you have runs that are longer than 256. Uh, uh, Pixels, so I need more. So I did a little trick that if there is an F zero, then effectively the zero is the least significant middle of the word. And the thing that comes after that is is like the most significant middle. And you can repeat that, and you can in theory store infinitely 
uh, in, in, in infinitely large numbers that way. So this little picture is encoded in 10 bytes. Um, in general, all the all the uh, digits plus some error messages, etc., cetera, uh, all compress into 11K, which is pretty nice. This is what it looks like. I, I cut out the time where the, the thing wasn't doing anything. So this is not this is not fast forward. This is just um, you know only the things. And uh, you will see that when it switches over, um, every so what I do normally, what you see right now, this is called a partial refresh, and it can do that pretty easily, but it leaves behind a bunch of crap. And if you do it too often, then your screen will just look like shit. So every 10 times I do a full refresh, and that is a little bit you see where the uh, where the things flicker. And the interesting bit is uh, when that happens, that is the moment people figure out that it's a clock. Every single person that went into my living room that did not know it uh, may have taken a look at it and it's like, you know, uh, if, it's, if, if, if it's around 7 o'clock, 1902, maybe that's like a date that is relevant to your family or something. Or, or you know, they'll they'll just think it's a random set, a set of stickers. Yeah. And then so refresh comes and they're like, what? <laughs> and at that point, they figure out it's a clock. And like, I, I, I could, like, I, I, I spaced it out a little bit because, you know, sure, but like the trick here is if you know, you know, if you don't know, it's a mystery, right? Because a lot of people do it for hours and a military format, so you guys are in the army. Potentially, potentially, but like a uh, 24 hour format is, is very common in other places as well. I mean, I set my clocks to 24 hours because I'm European, I like 24 hours more. I don't want to mess around with PM and AM. Um, so a few remarks. Uh, if you look very carefully at the back, you may, you may have seen, seen two reworks. Uh, one of them is a little thin wire here. That's a bootstrap pin that I forgot. Always set your bootstrap pins if you make a PCB for ESP32s. Um, the other thing is uh, a bit more obvious. Um, okay. like the thing has two LDOs that are in parallel. Um, I just said that 500 milliamps is enough for an ESP32 in a normal situation. Yeah, well, it turns out that this is not. So back of an E-ink contains all the electrodes, like on the glass, um, which effectively means that there's a, a mess of metal going on. About, I think this is 0.8? Yeah, uh, I don't know. About a millimeter above that is a Wi-Fi antenna. A Wi-Fi antenna that really, really, really wants to have space around it to radiate. If you put metal next to it, you, you mess with the impedance. Mm -hmm. um, one of the effects that it has is as soon as it tries to calibrate, it tries to put some, some energy in there. And holy crap, that is a giant spike of, of power that needs to go in there. So what I used to have is like the thing would just brown out. I would start it up and go Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, ah, then. <laughs> so um, yeah, I was like, what am I gonna do? I can't really re rework this aside, aside from the, 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 the fact that I already have the PCB, where am I gonna put the antenna? So, you know, I just decide to just, you know, YOLO, travel uh, <laughs> Um <laughs> Like, uh, to be fair, like the other side of the coin is that these things use Wi-Fi once or twice a day. This might not be good for the power amplifier inside the USB32. It'll leave. It's, it, it might break in like 20, 30 years. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. That's me. And um, yeah. It's, um... Great. If you have any questions, then it was thematic. There's one five from the cross this right way. Uh, schematic. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, this one? Yeah, R9. R9. Oh, uh, that is because for some reason, 32 kilohertz crystals are extremely finicky. Um, uh, it is, uh, especially in low power things like this, what the main chip tries to do is give it as little power as, as, as possible to make it start to oscillate. And then, you know, try to keep that oscillation going with as little power as possible. So the thing is that those two low capacitors and the parallel impedance are really, really important. And you kind of got to tweak those in order to uh, make the thing oscillate, start it properly, start it at the right frequency. 
So this thing has a cross through it because this is a uh, component that I wanted to have a footprint for on my PCB, but I didn't necessarily want to put a component in because I didn't know if I needed it yet. And the way you do that in uh, like the most recent KiCad version is that you mark it as do not place. Um, and KiCad shows that by putting a big ass cross through it. But the end effect is that uh, it does show up on my PCB, but it does not show up in my in my parts list in my bill of materials. So that's the that's the idea behind it. More questions? What's the uh, runtime of the push RG? Uh, well, I don't know yet. Uh, it's only been like a few months, and uh, I calculate this stuff to last for about a year. Um, it's a it's a bit flexible. We'll see. I I've been overestimating and underestimating these things. I wouldn't be surprised if after two years it still runs. So, uh, the cell is, I think, one point one amp hour. They're they're old Nokia battery. Well, old. They're they're newly manufactured, but the old model. So, um, like, who knows how many milliamps is actually in there? But yeah, let's see. But you said you use a couple times a day. Hmm? Sorry. You said you use twenty p a day. Uh, I use NTP, but only once a day. So once. the the um, uh, the thirty two kilohertz crystal is is exact enough to keep the time with only. Are you using it? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand you can use it for. No, no, no. I I I have to use it because. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, my next question was how hard it is to. Yeah, have that crystal keep running with the uh, low power Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's possible. You just gotta tweak it correctly. But like, uh, even a crystal has like, uh, I think one or two ppm, um, yeah. which which doesn't sound like much, but it's like a second or two over a day. And as I said, that adds up quickly. So once a day, I just synchronize, get rid of that. Done. No questions. Sorry again. Yeah, it's just uh, you know standard thing. You started the Wi-Fi stack. Uh, USB IDF has a built-in NTP client, so you just fire that up. You wait until it's done its thing, and then you shut down again. It's actually also a fallback. Say if uh, one of the one of the modules couldn't make a 10 second time where the broadcast happens. It'll also revert to NTP because rather clock that some time that uses a little bit more battery than you know a bad clock. Okay. There's no more questions and I'll pack my stuff. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Try a little about uh, ESP.